Hi, everyone, and welcome to the webinar, Work From Home World, how to keep your company data safe and work effectively. My name is Keith Schaefer, along with my partner, John Yakino, and we'd like to thank JMT Consulting for organizing this webinar, and I hope we can provide some useful information for everyone. A little bit about us, uh, we've been in the industry for 15 years each. We started as support desk technicians and we promoted to partners of Fairdicum eight years ago. And for those of you who don't know, Fairdicum is a New York City based company, um, an MSP, where we leverage technology to facilitate the growth of our clients. Here's John. Thanks, Keith. Hi, everyone. So let's go ahead and get started. So what is cybersecurity? Well, the dictionary definition of cybersecurity is the state of being protected against the criminal or unauthorized use of electronic data or the measures taken to achieve this. However, it differs industry to industry. The one constant though is the framework uh, which is used. It's basically the same for all industries. And we're gonna go ahead and take you through that quickly now. So we've broken up uh, the framework into five categories, assign, identify, discuss, enable, and repeat. Assign, this one's simple. You wanna make sure an internal employee or committee will be held accountable for the security of your company. Identify, you want to identify the risks where extra security may need to be present. Risk can be identified by third party scans or assessments. Credit and other companies similar to us run assessments for our clients as an example. A popular scan which we would run or have a third party run would be a penetration test. The next step is going to be to discuss the findings, um, whether you found through penetration tests or through internal dialogue and looking at your data, you're going to determine what can be implemented based on the risk associated with the vulnerability, as well as performance and budget impact. What you're looking for here is a balance between security and employees workflow. You're going to try not to inhibit their normal day to day process with the enhanced security that you're going to implement. Once you've discussed your findings and what you're going to implement, now it's time to actually implement the security measures, securing the most vulnerable points in data. What you're going to want to do here is plan it out. Your implementation timeline, who's it going to affect, how's it going to affect them? And then finally implement those security measures. Lastly, you're going to repeat this practice. You're going to create a policy to review the cybersecurity plan on at least an annual basis. However, you shouldn't think about it annually. Cybersecurity should be thought about consistently and constantly. Cybersecurity is an ever-changing entity, and it can't be thought of as a one-time discussion or one-time solution. We're even seeing changes now with the current global COVID crisis um, that attackers are using this as a tool to modify their existing attacks and take advantage of people's need for more information on the current incident. Um, so you're going to want to think about it on a consistent basis. So how are cyber criminals trying to breach your systems? Well, they're using many methods. The most common that we're seeing are social engineering and network vulnerabilities. With social engineering, their major types are phishing, third party breach data and malicious links. As for network vulnerabilities, we see a lot of weak policies or network misconfigurations that lead to attackers breaching your systems. We're going to go into these in more depth. Well, social engineering is one of the most common types of attacks, especially nowadays. This is where the hacker gathers data points on you, your business and your employees. The three main types of phishing are spear phishing, phishing and vishing with a V. Phishing is a general attack that relies on casting general emails, texts, IMs in order to trick the user. Common phishing examples are, please reset your password by clicking this link below or unknown access with a link to click. The goal is to get you to click the link and fill out the information in order to breach your accounts. Spear phishing is an enhanced version where they collect personal data to craft emails in order to target you specifically. Common uh, spear phishing tactics include emails sent to you with a display name of someone you know. They also may alert you to the fact that they have your password. Maybe it is your password, maybe it isn't, but they probably grabbed it from the dark web. Just as a quick sentence about the dark web is a place where hackers can search for emails, addresses, and passwords that have been breached. Vishing is a telephone equivalent of phishing emails. And most of the time they're trying to impersonate a bank or Microsoft in order to give up personal information about you and your accounts. 
the next slide, we're going to show you here are some <clears throat> tips for detecting phishing emails. Uh, so you have to examine the reply, uh, examine all the links. Uh, yeah, it is. If it's an unknown email, analyze the different fields in the email. If there's a link inside the email, go directly to the website rather than clicking inside the email. And John's going to talk about malicious links. Thanks, Keith. So malicious links. Yeah, these can be found in emails or sometimes even on websites. Um, as Keith mentioned before, the best tactic to avoid clicking on a malicious link is actually go outside of that email or that website and directly enter the website link or website itself uh, manually. This will avoid being subjected to any kind of malicious link. So what are these attackers trying to do with these malicious links? Most of the time they're trying to release some sort of malware, whether it be a keylogger or screen capture uh, or camera control. What these are doing are trying to get your physical activity logged and sent back to the attackers so they can parse through it and find any vulnerabilities that they can leverage to get further access into your system. Um, key loggers, for example, will capture all keystrokes that are entered on your keyboard. So those will pick up any kind of passwords or websites or security questions that you might be answering. Screen capture will take continuous pictures of your monitor and send those back, which will give the attacker more information about what you're doing and what sites you're visiting as well as camera control, which can pick up anything from documents, home layout, etc. Another type of malware that's released through malicious links is ransomware. I think we've all heard of ransomware in the news lately and over the past few years. Ransomware is a type of software that when installed on your device will actually go through each and every file, encrypt them with an encryption algorithm that is unbreakable and prohibits you from reopening those files. There's normally then a ransom that's asked for to give you the in decryption key, so then you can then access it. If you don't have backups to restore those files, sometimes you're subject to pay that ransom. And most of the time, the attackers won't even give up the decryption key. Um, and even if you are subjected to restore everything from backup, that can take hours or even days to recover. The next item is links to clone websites in order to harvest your credentials. So you might get a link to Facebook or Amex or Uber, and it's going to go to a doppelganger site. It's not the actual site. And what the attacker is trying to do there is have you log into your account because you think you're logging into your normal website, but really that data is being sent to the attacker so then they can then access your account. And then finally, link documents with embedded malicious code. We see this a lot with Adobe or Office documents where an attacker is able to embed malicious code within a PDF or another document. Once you open that document, it'll go ahead and install that program. And without proper antivirus, this will be missed and then malicious software will be installed. So it's always best to double check those links and always a better option to go ahead and go directly to the site. So third-party breach data. Why should you be concerned about breaches that occur outside of your organization? What do they have to do with you? Well, we find that a lot of users, employees are reusing passwords. So the same password that they use on their network login, they might be using that exact same password on their Facebook login or their LinkedIn profile. Or they may be using some variant of that. So perhaps your passwords which is a really bad password, it could be password one, and you're using password two on another site, or password three. What we see a lot of is reuse attempts where if a breach occurs, let's say at LinkedIn, attackers will use that information and try those passwords for that same user account at other organizations. So you should really have different passwords that are completely different from each other for every site that you're going to use. Network, home, personal sites, anything of the sort. The second item that can be released within a breach outside your organization is harvested personal information, such as your email address, your first and last name, social security number, credit card numbers, any personal identifiable data can be stored at a different organization. That could be then used to in a spear phishing campaign against you. If they have a password that was used previously, they might attempt to um, send out a blackmail email saying, hey, we have your password, here it is. But it was all taken from a breach site. So you do want to be wary about breaches that occur outside of your organization. Another item is weak policies. So commonly missed, commonly missed or weak policies that we see 
are usually password policies where they don't have a character minimum, such as our advice 10 character limit, or you're not using complex passwords, which uh, force a user to use uppercase, lowercase, numerical and special characters in a minimum requirement number. This will make a more secure password for you to use and a less easily breached account. Password expiration policies are something else that we like to see and help include, help uh, strengthen your policies, such as saying expiration every 90 days. Or a password history, so users cannot reuse the same password over and over again. Another policy we like to see is a lockout policy. What this does is if an attacker is trying to brute force your account, brute force is where they'll try multiple uh, password attempts success sequentially to try to access your account. If you have a lockout policy in place, within a certain amount of failed tries, it'll lock out your account for a set period of time. This will stop refresh attempts greatly. And lastly, security policies that we see that are commonly not used, but should be, are screensaver timeout locks. Let's say you leave your desk or your office for 15 minutes or so, and your computer has not been locked. That computer is now vulnerable to any passer buyer to go ahead and access your system. So what we recommend our clients do is have a screensaver lock of at least 15 minutes. So if you forget to lock your computer when you go out to lunch, it'll lock for you. As John mentioned, there are some, <clears throat> some items that are commonly overlooked by some IT providers. Uh, most common are local admin access on workstations and lack of centralized patch management. Local admin access allows hackers to gain control of your machine and corrupt data that you are linked to. Lack of centralized patch management allows for hackers to exploit vulnerabilities in the software. In the event of a zero day exploit, companies will companies without centralized patch management easily find themselves exposed. <clears throat> Content filtering. Uh, so some of <laughs> MFA is one of the ways that you know, you can enhance your cybersecurity along with content filtering and some others. MFA, you want this on all of your important email accounts, remote access, bank accounts, pretty much anywhere that offers it. Passwords are not secure enough these days, especially if it doesn't meet complexity requirements. The security measure requires another token to authenticate to your accounts. So basically, if I log into an email account and I put in my password, Sometimes I'll get a push notification on my phone that says, hey, someone's accessing your account, is this okay? And then you approve it. <clears throat> the token can be sent by, by the platform, by an SMS text notification, or even a phone call at some companies. Centralized AV. Now this allows you to protect against viruses and always good to have. Now that antivirus companies, antivirus companies are cloud-based, they allow centralized management of all machines. This means knowing which virus definitions are out of date and having the ability to update from one centralized console. The anti-ransomware malware detectors are useful in detecting payloads that might be dormant or programs that might be dialing back to the hacker's headquarters. Some things we use, uh, place, we place random files on your computer and if those files are changed in any way, it automatically locks down the machine and requires the users to contact us. You don't want to mess around with ransomware. Now, this is where it could cost your companies hundreds of thousands of dollars if the entire organization's file database is encrypted. Next one is intrusion prevention and detection software. Now, this usually resides on the firewall or some of the more expensive versions have their own appliances. They're used to alert IT of hackers trying to gain access to the network via brute force, DDoS, or other common methods. And then finally, content filtering is, this is either an appliance or firewall license that allows IT to restrict unwanted web pages. It usually looks to the real-time database of malicious sites to block, so it can constantly remain updated. For our companies, we have technology that block requests and open support tickets based on machines trying to repeatedly get out to the malicious site without the user's knowledge, essentially dialing back home. Content filters have been a valuable way of restricting employees from mistakenly getting infected. John's going to speak about DLP. Thanks, Keith. So data loss prevention, or DLP, is used to protect unauthorized or unusual access to data. Although this is normally used to ensure employees are not misusing their access rights, it can serve as an early warning system if unusual file access is found. 
which can point to an employee's account being compromised, such as files being accessed that are not normally accessed by that employee at that time or that day, or are being transferred outside of the organization. So it's a good early warning system to have. It's also very good to have just to monitor employee usage in a normal work day. Next item is security policies. This is a broad genre of policies that help to secure the network. They can range from password policies, as we mentioned previously, as well as stricter policies, which can help lock down certain vulnerabilities. For example, uh, a security policy we've seen used is stopping the use of USB drives. USB drives can carry malicious code in it or the ability to save files to your desktop. Beyond that, security policies can also reflect policies that should be set on daily processes outside of your technology, such as wire transfers, how wire transfers are authorized and verified, or how orders are placed with vendors. Security policies shouldn't be in place for all of these scenarios, so there's a clear definition of how to perform these activities and how to make sure that they're being performed properly and with the proper verification. Next is encryption. So encryption, this should be a standard on laptops and mobile devices, as well as any device containing backup files. If the hard drive were to fall into the hands of someone outside the organization, even if it's secured with a password, such as a laptop, they would be able to view all the data on that unencrypted device if the hard drive is removed from the laptop itself. There's no password policy on top of a physical drive, and it's able to be accessed if unencrypted. The next item is secure remote access methods. So. For us, the most secure remote access is using a VPN or Microsoft's RD web platform. These services have the ability to use MFA and are more strictly managed. It provides a more secure gateway for your employees to access your network data. <laughs> Thanks, John. Uh, so to enhance cybersecurity at home, uh, you know, use complex passwords and avoid password reuse. Um, basically, you don't want to go and put all of the same passwords on all of your different accounts. Um, let's say Target, you know, you have an email address of a Gmail account and a Target account that, that has your credit card linked. Um, once Target gets hacked, your, now your email address and your password and possibly your credit card information uh, is exposed. Um, so, so we recommend that you use different passwords because now they can't use that password to get into any other your accounts because you've been using different passwords for different platforms. Um, now you might say, this might get really confusing. How am I gonna keep track of all these passwords? Well, we recommend a secure password vault like LastPass. LastPass is able to store your, your email, your, basically your, the web address, your email address and your password securely. And you want to, you want to enable 2FA on that password vault as well. Yep. And further to enhance your cybersecurity at home, you're going to want to secure your home network. Uh, the first step in this is changing your default passwords for your internet of things devices. So for example, your wireless router has a default password on it. You're going to want to change any default passwords on any of these internet-based items. Uh, the reason for this is attackers will sometimes actually drive around and look for open access to these to these devices using these default passwords. Same thing for any web-based cameras that you might have. So any kind of nanny cams or home security cameras. So they'll have default passwords and usernames assigned to them, the first thing you want to do when you set them up is change these. Not only will they give access to attackers to those devices themselves, but sometimes they can get access to your actual network through these devices and ultimately might be able to get access back to your corporate network, depending on how far into your network they can get. The next important item is wireless network settings. So everyone's home Wi-Fi, it's nice to have an easy to remember password for it, but those easy to remember passwords are easily trackable as well. So what you want is a nice, complex, secure password, something with a minimum of 10 to 12 characters and using complex symbols, numbers, upper and lower case, just as you would have a complex password on your network login. <laughs> Lastly, we don't always think about it, but home devices should also be secured, secured with antivirus um, software as well. If your home computer is compromised, especially nowadays where we're all working from home or the majority of us are, your home computer is directly connected to your network 
environment in most cases. And an attacker could get leverage through your home computer to your corporate network. So you're gonna wanna make sure you have antivirus installed. Next, be cautious when using public hotspots. This might not be as big of an issue at the current moment, but as we get through this and you begin to use public hotspots again, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you're not accessing your bank account, your corporate environment, any personal logins to public hotspots. What's used here is called a man in the middle attack where a public hotspot can be compromised and your data is sent through an attacker and then on to those actual websites. In the middle, that attacker is gaining all the credentials that are being entered and all the information that's being submitted. Lastly, you're going to want to use MFA where offered. MFA is not just a corporate security uh, service. MFA is now being seen on Gmail, bank accounts. Um, any online subscription that you have most likely has the ability to use MFA and wherever it is offered, we strongly encourage that to be used there. Yeah, it doesn't matter whether you are a small business or a conglomerate, breaches occur to everyone. They do not discriminate much like the coronavirus, right? 73% of America has their compromised accounts on the dark web. Many of them have not changed their passwords. And if your IT scour the dark web to see if your email address has been compromised, both personal and business, they should be doing that. There should be an alert given off to you saying, hey, your email address has been compromised because this company has been breached. At Freight Income, we actually actively monitor the dark web for compromised accounts uh, for our clients to ensure that they are aware and that they need to change their passwords and protect those accounts associated with the breach. And ransomware is not going away. Um, you know, hackers are only getting more complex. And a lot of people think of hackers as this hooded character in front of a in front of a computer in a dark room, when in fact, they're businesses. There are businesses in other countries with managers just like us, you know, with presidents just like us, um, trying to steal your data. So, so please, please be, be careful and secure those data, secure that data any way you can. MFA is the way to go. So I think uh, with that, we'd like to conclude and thank JMT Consulting. Um, we really appreciate the opportunity to come and speak to you all. And we want to open the floor for any questions you might have. We're happy to discuss any and all questions related to home and or business. Thanks, everyone. Great. Thank you so much, Keith and John. Uh, just a reminder for people, if you do have questions, uh, you can submit them through the Q&A portion of your control panel. Uh, but I do have a few questions for you. Uh, first, can you elaborate on security training? Uh, sure, yeah, this is John. Um, uh, security training probably is the most important in my eyes for securing your network. Um, as many layers of security as you could add to either your home network or your corporate environment, um, really employees are going to still need access. So there's gonna be a vulnerability there that attackers are gonna hit on. Um, so making sure that employees are aware of all security measures to take place is very important. The way we do that is twofold. One is we uh, advocate having uh, phishing tests done. So what will happen is on a random basis, there'll be a series of uh, test phishing emails that are sent out to a corporation. Um, and what happens there is each action is logged in a report. So whether an employee opened an email, clicked on a link or entered information is then compiled and categorized and put into a report. Once that report is created, we then go ahead and initiate a training session or a track. And for those users that, depending on the level of risk that we see associated with the individual user, we'll assign different tracks to them. And it's all online based training. Uh, they'll go through some short videos, um, fill out some multiple choice questions, just to ensure that your users are aware of what they should do if they see a suspicious email, where they get something out of the ordinary that they're not used to seeing, how they should act or react to that. So it's really important to train your users. And it's not a one-time item either. Uh, like all security items, everything is ongoing. We normally advise our clients to have a quarterly training. All right, thank you. Uh, sure. Another question for you. Can you explain more about centralized patch management? 
Sure. Um, this is Keith. Um, well, centralized patch management is basically um, uh, a central location where uh, someone will review the patches and then push them out to all the machines. So in our instance, we have uh, a company called Automate, which houses all of our uh, clients and all of, all of their workstations. Uh, it's a little piece of software that we put on their workstation so we can monitor, you know, not only patches, but their, you know, CPU utilization, their memory utilization, et cetera. So with this comes, um, you know, an attachment to Microsoft. And, if, and basically uh, what happens is the, the patches get, get looked at, they get approved, and, then they, and once they're approved, they get approved to be installed. And once it's, once it's approved to be installed in the centralized location, it gets thrown out to all of the computers that are on that domain or for all of those clients. And we're also able to block patches um, and you know, schedule patches to be installed immediately. So there's a lot of options and, and it basically does a great job of keeping uh, the operating system up to date. Uh, we also use something called Ninite, which is a, a third party patch patching applications. So if you have Adobe, um, if you have, uh, you know, Java, basically this, this, uh, this tool will go out and update all of those third party applications that you have on your machine. So it, it is a twofold process um, where you have to keep everything updated uh, in order to know that you're secure and you're not actually being vulnerable and exploited through some, uh, some patch that wasn't installed. Yeah, and just to add to Keith's answer, um, with that centralized patch management, it also allows us to see which computers are not being updated, whether it be with the third party patching or your operating system patching like Windows. Um, so a nice little thing that we bring with us to meetings is a report showing which computers have not checked in, which have not been updated. And that ensures that across the board, your network is secured. Because even if you have one machine that's not been updated, that's going to be a security hole into your network. All right, we've got a lot of questions coming in now. So uh, next one is for remote work support, what platform do you recommend for video conferencing? Is there any special security issues to be considered with video conferencing? So yes. Um, I know personally we use Microsoft Teams and I know a lot of people are using Zoom out there. Um, and, you know, this is, uh, there's been a popular phrase going around called Zoom bombing. Uh, this is when unknown people kind of join your, they join your uh, video conferencing and they might throw up something or make some noise or cause some disruption. So uh, with Zoom specifically, you, al you always want to try and use a private meeting. Uh, you want to make sure that your personal meeting ID uh, you get a personal meeting ID with Zoom, so you want to make sure that you keep that kind of private. Uh, if you do end up publicly allowing someone to have your uh, meeting ID, then they can jump into that meeting anytime they want. Uh, another good security measure is always have a password on your meetings. Uh, I know it might be a little, you know, income, uh, troublesome to do so, but, you know, it, it will secure your meeting. Uh, also, be thoughtful about links posted in meetings that you don't know who some of the some of the people are. Um, if someone was accidentally able to join your meeting and they post a link in the chat, then if you click that link, that could just be like a malicious link in an email. So you really should be careful about that as well. Yeah, another another way to secure Zoom is kind of the big one right now that's that's being that's having issues. Um, so something else they have they recommend is there's a waiting room feature. So you can actually only allow participants that you know into your Zoom conference. So that's another tactic besides using the per meeting as Keith suggested, which is the best way to do it. You can also enable the waiting room feature and then allow specific um, viewers in. Okay. Next question, what technology do you use for remote IT support services and help desk? So for remote support, um, do you say what, what like applications, uh, what applications we use? So for remote, we use uh, what's called ConnectWise. Uh, we're a ConnectWise shop. Um, so we use Automate and Manage and Screen Connect to connect to uh, users' workstations. So it's a, a very robust platform that allows us to manage pretty efficiently. 
All right. Next question. Do you recommend that laptops be required to log into the server for patch management and virus updates and backups when laptops are taken home? Um, so it's, it's really dependent on what system your IT provider is using to provide centralized patching. Um, the system that we use is a remote agent. So basically a remote agent is just an application that's installed on each computer. Um, and this allows, and this is another benefit of having kind of a cloud-based centralized patching system. Uh, when, that can, when that laptop is taken home, it still connects to the internet and then ho phones back home to the main network and receives its updates as it should, along with the rest of the uh, computers, those in the network and outside of it. Um, another item that we do, because in case, let's say an employee takes a laptop home, shuts it off during the patch window, um, we'll have it configured. So the next time that computer boots, they'll go ahead and install the patches. Um, and we can kind of manipulate that where there's some lead time in it so that a employee isn't kind of impeded in starting his work because he's you no, know, it's Monday morning, he just turned it on. Um, you really don't want the updates to start right then. So there'll be some buffer before it actually installs, but that ensures every computer, no matter where it is, is getting its updates. Right, so, so to add on to John's, um, you're assuming that there needs to be a VPN or some connection to the network. Uh, with the software that we use there, we don't need that. Um, but there is, it is possible that uh, some, might, some you know, larger corporations uh, require that whenever the laptop is turned on, it automatically VPNs into the network in which it contacts their centralized patch management. So there's, it, it all depends on what platform you use. All right, so we've got two more questions. Uh, what are some of the systems employees should look for on their devices to determine if they've been compromised and what can they do if they've been hacked? Um, I'll take the uh, how to notice some, some compromises. Well, uh, you know, you might get malware on your machine um, that will, you know, change your 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 uh, default browser engine or you know make it go to a website every time you open up a browser you know there's there's also it could be slowing down your computer weird pop-ups um you know if the computer's not acting the way it should you know sometimes it might be because it's old and dated sometimes it might be because it's infected uh it really depends and, and should get someone uh, to at least run a scan the great uh really good scan to use Malware bytes, uh, we use that quite often, um, where you know you just run a scan and it'll tell you what's infected and what's not. Don't be alarmed. Uh, they do tend to uh, have like Google web pages come up from time to time, uh, but but it's usually uh, usually nothing. Um, other than that, John, can you think of any sure I, other I, telltale yeah, signs? Sure. Um, any kind of um disruption in your web browser. So sometimes you'll see where your searches are not actually going through the search engine that you normally use. Let's say it's Google and all of a sudden it's a weird um, search yeah, engine now. Persistent. Yeah, exactly. That's when you want to run a scan. Um, I wasn't, if you could refresh my memory, was this asking if you have a corporate device at home that you may, you think might be in trouble or was it just a personal home device were they asking? It just, it says, it says, what are, what are some of the symptoms employees should look for on their devices to determine if they've been compromised and what can they do if they've been hacked? Sure. So it doesn't specify. Okay. okay. So for either way, yeah, if it's, a, if it's a corporate device, either at home or in the office, and you believe you've been hacked or have some malicious software on there, the best thing to do is just shut it down and then alert your IT provider. Um, because things like ransomware or any kind of um, worm virus uh, is going to start leaking into the network. So you definitely want to stop that from happening. So if you have any inkling that something suspicious is going on, the best thing to do is shut it down and go find your IT provider. Um, if it's a home issue, uh, what I advise is, as Keith has said, download Malwarebytes, run that scan uh, a couple times. Uh, once it's clear, you can go ahead and you should be fine. It usually finds everything. Um, but yeah, one in doubt, disconnect it from the network and see what you can do to clear it out using antivirus programs or um, malware uh, 
removal programs. So malwarebytes is a good one. Um, I believe Norton and Kaspersky have some free antivirus. Uh, there's a product called Avast. Um, again, per you know uh, our presentation before, even home machines need to have antivirus on it. It's not just a corporate item. So you should really invest in a quality antivirus. Um, there's a lot out there, uh, but Norton, ESET, those are the big names which I would recommend. And uh, what happens if you get breached? Well, first things first, um, clean. Uh, con if you're in the business, contact your IT. Um, the, they probably have a list of things to do to make sure that um, the network isn't compromised as well as your accounts or your computer. So um, that would be the first step. The second step, let's say if it was home. If you're home, you'd run all the, you run AV scans and malware scans. And then you'd go and change your password for all of your accounts. Um, anything that you've accessed, you know, recently, just change your passwords. Um, figure out how they may have gone in, you know, and, and either learn from from what happened. Uh, if you can figure out, well, oh, I thought I clicked this link. They must have got in through there. Well, then, you know, go back, check the email, see if it's malicious or delete it. Uh, and then change your passwords, update your antivirus, and run run some malware scans. Yeah, the the worst possible thing you can do is nothing. Um, so I have seen in our professional career where, you know, an employee will get nervous that maybe they clicked on the wrong link and they don't want to say anything, um, and then it just causes a heap of trouble. So uh, no one is going to be upset if you know if someone comes to the IT department and says, "Hey, I accidentally clicked on this link, and I think I might have downloaded something." That's really bad. Um, the best thing to do is alert someone as soon as possible. So that would be my advice. Okay, so one last question. Does your thought for use of personal computers from home versus company issued equipment, what could be done to manage risk on the use of home personal computers? Um, I could take this one, Keith. Um, yeah. So. As IT guys, we would always recommend that there be corporate um, devices given for work from home just because of the ease of management. Um, you know, we could put our tools on it. We can ensure everything's up to date. Um, but we know in the, in, in the real world, um, it's a lot of bring your own devices and use them from home and everything's connected. Um, so the best security measure that you can do is as a, as a corporation or as a company is to make sure that your employees are accessing your network remotely via either a VPN, a virtual private network, or um, some kind of remote access system. Our preference is uh, Microsoft's RD Web. Um, both of these features allow you to connect securely through encryption to an encrypted connection. Um, and then all of that traffic is monitored by your IT company. Um, and there's other policies that could put, be put in place. So for example, a VPN could force users to ensure they have antivirus before they connect. So at least you know everything mm -hmm. that's connecting to your network is protected in some way or have a minimum patch requirement level to connect. Um, so those are the two ways we would advise. We personally yeah. don't like uh, like a go to my PC or a log me in type. Um, that's more for convenience because we cannot manage you know, several computers that people are remoting into versus a remote desktop uh, scenario or RD web, where it's a single server everyone connects to and IT can concentrate on keeping that device up and running during your remote times. Yeah, I think you wanna be really careful about using third party remote access tools. Uh, go to my PC, log me in. Um, those can be, as you know, uh, I don't know if you know, Team Viewer was compromised a few years ago um, and it was a big push to make sure all of our clients had removed Team Viewer from their domain. So they can be compromised if they're not set up correctly now they now you know, a hacker could have direct access to your computer or your, you know, your home computer or your business computer. So those third party tools, although convenient, um, they pose actually a bigger threat uh, than, than they should. And just to further, um, and uh, you know, the recent trend is, or not so recent trend is to go into a more cloud-based solution. So not everything is housed within your uh, company network. Um, so Office 365, Dropbox, box.com, things like that. Those are secure 
uh, methods of re working remotely. So any device can connect to those uh, platforms wherever they are. Um, but you should not just use the basic security that they're using. Um, all of those companies allow for multi-form factor authentication. So it is, it's imperative that that be put in place for all of your cloud-based platforms. So your email, uh, file repositories, um, sharing sites should all have MFA authentication turned on and enabled. Um, that'll further secure you uh, working from home to your environment. And for nonprofits too, uh, you know, you guys have donor uh, platforms that you use. Uh, I would make sure that if they're an online donor platform, um, you know, there's plenty out there that they do have the security you need before you sign up for that platform. Uh, you want to make sure that that, that, that cloud-based platform does have some sort of security like 2FA uh, so that you can work safely. All right, so we had another question come in. It says, based on what you said, VPN access is better than log me in and go to my PC. Could you please go over it? Thanks. Sure. Uh, and yeah, our, our main reasoning for the VPN access over the individual is, is two parts. One, for the ease of IT management. Um, so if you just imagine there's, let's say, 40 desktops in an environment, and each individual user is accessing each computer via log me in, you're more likely to have an issue on those individual devices than if someone was to use a VPN. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with a VPN, um, you can think of it as kind of a direct connection to your network. So imagine you had a long ethernet cord from your home to your office. Um, that's what a VPN tunnel is doing. It's connecting you directly. Um, with that VPN tunnel, as I mentioned before, you can apply certain management protocols on there to only allow specific devices to connect and beyond that to ensure that those devices that are connecting have adequate security measures in place, updates, antivirus, et cetera. Um, so that's where the security comes in place. And as Keith mentioned before, um, some of those cloud platforms that allow remote access to your individual computers can be compromised. It's a bigger target um, than your company's VPN. Uh, so there is that risk associated with using that type of platform over a VPN. Yeah, it, it, another thing is that when you connect to a VPN, your company is most likely going to have you route through their office. So that means you're picking up a lot of the, the um, security measures that the company has in place already, uh, such as content filtering, right? If I'm going to a website, my website actually routes through the office and that office has a server that says you have to go through this content filter first before allowing you to get to that website. So having that in place is just another security measure um, that a VPN can offer. Um, and the log me in and the team viewers, um, like I said, they just, they just provide direct access to your machine. Chances are your log me in password is the same password as your, you know, um, your, your password to get on your computer. So uh, it's, it's, Definitely. I mean, you can be secure with log me in with all if you take advantage of all their security measures. Um, but it's out of the control of the IT department, which means it's an outlier and some in some compliance purposes for some businesses. That's not, um, you know, that you can't do that. You can't have these third party remote applications. So it depends on the business instance. Um, but but we find that VPN is much more uh, manageable. We had another question come in. What do you think about Chrome remote desktop for remote access? Yeah, so that, uh, I'm familiar. Yeah, I'm familiar with Chrome remote desktop. Um, I, I've used it personally just, you know, for one off connections. Uh, again, it's, it, it's the same. It's going to be the same as log me in and go to my PC. Um, it does work with your Gmail account directly. Um, and you are able to put MFA on your Gmail, um, so slightly more secure. Um, I think if we're if we're talking about a very small office, if it's only a couple of people, um, and you're forced to use it, then I would just say whatever you, product you use, just ensure that you can use MFA for that connection, um, and at least add a layer of security. So if you were going to tier it out, it would be you know your bottom tier is going to be the Cloud, remote cloud platforms, log me in, go to my PC, uh, Chrome remote desktop, et cetera. Then you'll move up to uh, VPN and RD web. All 
Also, you have to keep your computer right. on all the time, right, John? Yeah, exactly. I mean, it, it, we're two <laughs> IT guys, and uh, we've just, you know, there's been a lot of late nights where the cleaning crew kicks out the plug on a desktop, and now you've lost your remote access. And especially in a time like now, where it's even more difficult to get to uh, a physical office space and turn that computer on or, you know, resolve the issue with that individual computer, just for the, the, the single point of management uh, is why it's our preference. Um, I really don't want to be so down on those others because I do know a lot of people are using them because that's kind of their only remote access. So that's what I'll say is, is at least add the MFA security to that, uh, to that option. All right. So that's all of our questions. So thank you, everyone. Those are some great questions. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and wrap us up as most Keith and John, if you have anything else that you want to add before I close this down. No, thank no, you. I just want to thank everybody for, for, for joining the webinar. Well, we appreciate your time, Keith and John, and thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, if you are interested in more webinars, uh, you can go to jmtconsulting.com and click on our events tab. Uh, you can also visit the Fair Dinkum website. Uh, if you want to get in touch with Keith or John, you can also reach out to info at JMT Consulting and we can put you in touch with them. Uh, thank you again, everyone, for joining us and I hope that you have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. Right. Great, thank you, everyone.